a video um, for to uh, sort of give you a rough idea of how I have used the interactive learning space to teach Theater 317, which is pre-modern theater history. Um, very briefly, we studied the ancient Greeks to about 1800, and we will read about 12 or 13 plays and then talk about the cultural context of the era as relevant to that play. So the lecture you're gonna see here, we're talking about the Oliver Goldsmith play, She Stoops to Conquer, which was written in the 1700s in England. And so this particular subset of lecture you're gonna see is me talking about the way in which British theater in the 18th century became very morally uptight uh, and, and that basically the Brits believe that all theater must teach a clear moral lesson and the actual playwright we're dealing with here, Alva Goldsmith, had this radical idea that theater doesn't need to teach a moral lesson, just needs to be funny. Um, but in this little clip right here, what you're going to see me do is use the Eno board to take notes on the students' interactions with uh, my lecture material. So in order to keep the lecture material interactive and conversational rather than just have them sit and be passive, I ask a lot of questions. The Eno board then gives you an opportunity to take notes on their answers to the questions and to see... Uh, for them to be able to, to save those notes and save those responses and see them later. And I'll talk about how we save those uh, and how they're made available a little bit later. A um, couple things. You'll notice the students are not looking at me. That's because uh, the image is also displayed on the television table or television at the end of each of their tables. This takes a little, getting, a little bit of getting used to. And I found that, frankly, it doesn't decrease participation at all. Um, when I ask a question here in a minute, I'll get quite a few responses, and I will get students looking at me during that time, but just that shift in where their chairs are physically pointed can take some adjustment. Uh, the other note, you'll see me save the image on the marker board and then clear that image off uh, and, and delete it so that I can write it right again later, and that's a, a technological thing that you'll work through in your actual training on the Eno board. So here we go. Here's one of the great examples of how the uh, 18th century Brits are worried about morality. A guy named Thomas Bodler takes a look at Shakespeare and notices how obscene Shakespeare is. Shakespeare's obscene? Tell me why. Why would he think that? <coughs> Compared to the rover, we already talked about that, right? But Bodler's going after Shakespeare saying, oh, I don't know about this, yes? Well, there's a lot of supernatural... Yeah, no, absolutely. So we're so we're not dealing with sort of traditional Christian morality, the idea of witches in Macbeth, etc. That can be really troubling. What else? Well, you have people like disobeying their authority, mm -hmm. like in Romeo and Juliet, and like yeah, abs outright like disobeying their parents mm -hmm. completely. That's yeah. certainly part of the issue. Yeah, and, like Midsummer, you know, the two run away from the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I mean, all of Shakespeare, well, again, we've talked about this a lot this semester, one of the reasons we love it is because he writes complex human characters rather than people who are good or bad. And that moral complexity can be kind of scary. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, well, it's not to the degree that we have today. There's some, there's some sexual things in there. Okay, like what? Like in Midsummer, everybody's going after everyone, and while they're not dropping trowel, Okay. I know that's not No, 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 I think so, right? I mean, uh, sex is, uh, is there, right? It's alluded to. It's not directly referenced. But so we have questionable morality or unclear morality. We've got references to sexuality, right? We have unpunished rebellion, which we don't always like to see. Well, there's certainly a lot of killing. Yeah, uh, especially yep. in Titus. Killing? Uh, right, violence. We have quite a lot of that. What I was else? Say violence. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So, right. And one of the things we need not forget about Shakespeare is that there are obscenities. Like, well, I've, I think I've already mentioned this once. Once you guys are familiar with the character Falstaff, one of the one of Shakespeare's quintessential fools. Falstaff is a wordplay about impotence. Falstaff. Right? Uh, and there are jokes like that littered throughout Shakespeare. They're not as obvious as what we see in the rover, but they're all over the place. And and they're so steeped in Shakespearean language and culture that when we read them, we tend to sort of miss them. But they're out there. So I just want to sort of r remind you guys that 
Yes, Shakespeare's not as obvious and blatant as um, the Rover and his other restoration theater, but Bogler notes that we have sort of a problem, and so what he does is he censors, he censors Shakespeare and publishes the family Shakespeare in ten volumes in which nothing is added to the original text, but those words and expressions are omitted which cannot with propriety be read aloud in a family. <laughs> this doesn't happen until 1818, so I'm getting a little anachronistic and, and out of time, but Bogler is working during the 1700s, and the morality that he's responding to is definitely gearing up in the 1700s. The Eno you know, board and the room in terms of lecture, let's talk about it in the terms of discussion. Uh, the clip you're going to see here is, I have, I've just lectured on another aspect of Goldsmith's play, and, and She Stoops to Conquer, and I've talked about the way in which Goldsmith is not trying to moralize, but as I said earlier, he's just trying to make a, write a funny play. And so I pose a question to the students, is, in what way is this play funny and not moral and preachy and sentimental and emotional? Um, in what way is this play sort of a good example of farcical satirical comedy and British wit? And I pose that question and then at each of the tables the students are, are there and they have pulled up, um, and you can see it here, they will have pulled up the script of the play on uh, a Google document. And I've made these Google documents available beforehand. So we're going to um, basically allow the students then to collaborate and all be seeing the same portion of the script and I'll be talking about it. Uh, one of the laptops on the table is plugged into a hockey puck. And so the whole group can kind of see what that one person is looking at, but also everybody has the Google script on their computers. Um, and this gives the students the chance to get into the meat of the text and to find how the lecture material I've given them applies to the actual play. And I recognize that uh, um, you may not be working from anything like a play script, but I would say there's probably some kind of material that you could give to your students to have them collaboratively discuss around this table. Alternately, you might just create an open-ended discussion document on Google Docs that everyone at the table is required to contribute to. That would be another option. I'm actually going to try that one a little bit in the fall. So instead of them bringing up a Google Doc that has the script on it and making margin comments, which is how I did it this semester, what I might try in the fall is, uh, or in the spring, the next time I'm in the space, what I might try is uh, this idea that I will have a pre-created blank document with question prompts. And so question three or whatever question they're working on right here would be them saying, would be me saying in the document, in what ways is this play favoring wit and comedy over emotion and moralizing? And then the students themselves would have to basically actively in a live collaborative sense type in answers to that question on the Google Doc and then we could save those questions uh, in the end and they could go back and look at them. Either way, this is a good example of the way in which I can help guide the discussion but also let the students be really proactive and interactive and collaborative and take good advantage of the uh, table and take good advantage of the TV monitor. Right, find another couple of examples of that. Favorite comedy? I like that comedy. All right, what are we talking about? We're talking about when Mrs. Hardcastle realizes that the jewels actually are missing, not just Tony's like pretending to play along with the missing, and she gets very, um, we are robbed, my dear husband broken up, and the jewels taken out, and I'm undone. She gets kind of like, oh, well, it's me. And Tony continues to be like, I'll play along. Um, uh, sure, I know they're gone, and I'm to say so. So he's like very... Let me just keep on this. <laughs> yep, they're gone. Really we keep, but um, she keeps. But she's genuinely concerned. Yeah, right? but yeah. she's not like. Um, she she keeps like playing after that. No, I gotta convince you they're actually gone. Yeah. Not just like, you know, sitting down in a chair and like, oh, we're so, you know, the whole heroine. Well, and if right, so if this is an emotional, sentimental comedy, then then we as the audience are now expected to get involved and concerned. Like, oh no, the jewels are like worried about Mrs. Hardcastle, but we're slapping right. at Tony because he's like, ha ha, it's yes. going on the train. Yep. So we got the comic character at Tony. Also, why are we not emotionally connected to Mrs. Hardcastle? Um, so why don't you care about her from a deep emotion? That's exactly correct. <laughs> she's a little silly. That's what I mean. So that's the way he does it. Oh, that's the way he avoids like, falling into this trap of emotion. Find me an example of Mrs. Hardcastle being silly. Right? And we're going to call her silly. Like, show me how she's Yeah, at the end when she's like. Out. Okay, find the text. Yeah. I agree, right? We, it leans more towards farce than it does towards any sort of like yeah. uh, um, emotional. And she doesn't even recognize her husband oh, for like a long time because she's too busy yeah. flipping out about stuff. And then she's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's you. Yes. <laughs> okay, so find that. We've got about one minute. Give me a good quote from her. Yeah.
So what you'll see here is the third part of the pedagogy that I use in the inter interactive learning space. After we have, uh, after students have, in their groups, dug into the text, uh, put margin comments in the Google Doc, and really kind of come up with with some specific examples and answered my lecture question, then I'll bring everybody back together and I will ask the students to basically tell me what they found. And so this this allows uh, the whole class to kind of come back together and benefit from everyone's different small group interactions and investigations. And then I will be at the Eno board in this next clip uh, and you'll see me taking notes on what they have to say and really mixing the, the dual approach of uh, shaping and organizing and focusing those notes to get them to the teaching points I want them to get to, but also to genuinely let them run the class and, and to be responsible for coming up with good discussion material and good conclusions about the play that we can put up on the board. Uh, and so it, it really does increase student interaction, student engagement, and I would argue student ownership of the material. Because the Eno board images are shaped by my, obviously, perspective as a teacher, but they are largely shaped by how much work the students have done to get into the text of the play and understand it. So we'll see how that next section works. So, how does this play favor comedy over emotion? I think, um, when, at, at the very beginning of the prologue, it's not the Mr. Woodward comes in. And it's, it very blatantly says, you know, I'm crying now because good comedy is long gone. Yep. Right? So it mocks this idea of emotion, right? We get this from the very beginning. And that's a good reminder that the prologue is not in the digital script. So, yep. All right, what else? Other examples? Comedy over emotion. The yeah. servant bit um, with uh, Hardcastle and Diggory especially when he's like, ah, mind how I hold them. I learned to hold my hands this way when was upon the drill militia. And Hardcastle's like, you must not be so talkative. What is wrong with you? Yes, it's just right? all ban witty banter between the two. And, and I think that's the word that keeps coming back, right, is this notion of wit, which is a very British idea uh, that, we, that we tell stories in a witty manner rather than this sort of emotional, sh sappy, schlocky manner. So we got that exchange between servants and Hardcastle. What else? No. When uh, Tony is talking with Mrs. Hardcastle, mm -hmm. trying to like pretend that the jewels are gone, they're having that dialogue between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Hardcastle, when she realizes, oh, the jewels actually are gone, she starts freaking out. But Tony continues the whole, oh yeah, they're really gone, and um, uh, we're we're laughing at Tony and not feeling for Mrs. Hardcastle mm -hmm. because she is so um, kind of like yeah, she's silly throughout the play. And the part we found to emphasize that was in Act 5, Scene 2, when they're um, stuck in the backyard, like mm -hmm. in the swamp so far away from home. Yeah. Um, she well, says, I wish we were at home again. I never met so many accidents in such a short journey. Drenched in mud, overturned in a ditch, stuck fast in a slaw, jolted to a jelly, and at last to lose our way. Whereabouts do you think we are, Tony? And she doesn't recognize they're in their backyard. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another, right? Uh, there's a return to a lot of farce. And... Here we are with the Theater 317 Section 2 website. So all of the previous information you just saw me gather on the Eno board and from the class uh, is then moved onto the website for students to access so that they can study whenever they'd like to and so that they can uh, review and make sure that they understand all the uh, teaching points and, and lessons. So <clears throat> I'll jump over here to Unit 13, which is what you saw me working on in the class, uh, 18th century British theater and the play She Stoops to Conquer. Uh, and you can see, uh, this was there was a minor technical issue with the Uno board for that one, but you can see the image that I uh, captured on the various problems that Thomas Bodler had with Shakespeare's obscenity, and that my undergraduate TA, who manages all these images for me, um, takes them and, and sort of puts them in a little bit of context as necessary. Uh, one part of the video that we skipped was the conversation about middle class entertainment and morality, and I took some notes on that. Uh, that the students gave me. And then this is the one you saw me offering, uh, discussing in class, this contrast between how She Stoops to Conquer favors comedy and wit over emotion and moralizing. Uh, and, and really all I've done here, as you saw me in class, is just uh, uh, take notes on what the students understand and, uh, and provide them an access, uh, access to a resource and an archive of the class conversation. I found that most students took notes anyway, but the feedback I got was that they were able to compare their notes with what was written on the uh, website on the Eno board images here and get some really useful feedback and understanding of how they had correctly or not correctly understood the course material. 
Then down here at the bottom, I also have my undergraduate TA go through the Google Doc of the script and pull out relevant uh, margin comments. There was only one for uh, uh, She Soups the Conquer. There were lots. There were more margin comments for others. Um, but for this one in particular, we have this particular, uh, the specific moment where one of the students has made a margin comment about a particular place in the play, and so my undergraduate TA thought that that would be a good place to pull that out. So uh, what we get all through this website then is uh, um, this mix of EnoBoard images that are stocked with student input and student responses. So the kids are, the students are really driving the, the class content. Um, but then we also have a clear organization in terms of uh, how the semester comes together and this gives them a place to go and study for the exam and make sure they understand uh, the concepts. Here's just a quick tour through some other you know, board images just to give you a rough idea. And you can see the website up here at the video uh, at the top of the, the uh, browser window. So if you want to go check, or check it out and poke around it, by all means. So. Those are the basic ways in which I used uh, the Eno board and the uh, discussion tables and TV monitors in the interactive learning space to uh, enhance my pedagogy for Theater 317.